The most vulnerable part of the Earth's ecological system by far is the climate system. And there's a very simple reason why that sometimes uh, is obscured from our view. When we walk out of this building and look up at the sky, it seems like a vast and limitless expanse. But as most are aware, in reality, it's an incredibly thin shell surrounding the planet with a total volume of molecules that is only a tiny fraction of what exists in our imagination of the sky. And the power of 7.6 billion people with these powerful technologies that use fossil fuels for 80% of our energy means that we are spewing 110 million tons of man-made heat-trapping global warming pollution into that thin shell of atmosphere every day. We are treating it as an open sewer for the gaseous waste of our global civilization. We are trapped inside that sp spherical uh, atmosphere that surrounds us, that little shell. And the accumulated amount of man-made global warming pollution that we have dumped there now traps as much extra heat energy compared to the entire existence of humanity prior to now, as much extra heat energy as would be released by 500,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every day. It's a big planet. But that is an enormous amount of energy. And there are certain aspects of the climate system, ocean currents, wind currents, indeed most parts of the Earth's ecological system that are finely tuned to the conditions present when human civilization first built our first cities 10,000 years ago. This extra heat energy goes predominantly into the oceans. And the Earth system as a whole tends to even out the heat distribution. All such open systems do. And in the case of our planet, the primary engine driving the climate system is the redistribution of heat from the tropics on either side of the equator to the poles. Because, of course, the sun hits a direct, at a more direct angle in the tropics year-round, and only a glancing blow six months of each year at the poles, respectively. So how is this heat redistributed? Through the ocean currents and through the wind currents and complex phenomena like El Nino and others that are less known in popular culture. The temperature differential between the North Pole, which is more significant because of the land mass that is in bulk in the Northern uh, Hemisphere and uh, crucial in the Southern Hemisphere, but Antarctica is isolated by the Southern Ocean. But the temperature differential between the temperature at the North Pole and the temperature at the equator is a kind of formula, X over Y. And it helps define the pattern of all of these ocean and wind currents. And we're changing it. Because even when the sun hits a glancing blow at the North Pole, it encounters ice and snow, and the ice and snow melts, and the Arctic Ocean is melting. And when it melts, the sun's rays don't bounce off anymore. They're absorbed by the dark ocean and the dark land. And so the temperature increases two to four times more rapidly in the Arctic as it does in the tropics. So all of these patterns are struggling to maintain the equilibrium that has existed for the entirety of our civilization's history, and they're now changing. 
The Northern Hemisphere jet stream, which has served, among other purposes, the movement of storms and weather systems across the North American continent and Eurasia, is now becoming a bit chaotic with large loops and episodic periods of disorganization. Why does that matter? Well, two weeks ago, Hurricane Florence hit uh, North and South Carolina. And instead of moving off, it just stayed there. The same thing happened one year ago with Hurricane Harvey in Houston, Texas, which dropped as much water as 500 days of the full flow of Niagara Falls, five feet of water. And Hurricane Florence three weeks ago was the fifth once in a thousand year rainfall event in the previous 12 months in the United States. And I'm not even mentioning Super Typhoon Manghut, which was even stronger and even bigger and devastated parts of Luzon and the Philippines and then Hong Kong. And the range of consequences that we're seeing are apocalyptic. And the scientists predicted them. And the scientists were exactly right. And because they were right, we should pay more careful attention to what they're predicting now will occur if we continue to put another 110 million tons every single day up there. Do we want to lose 50% of the living species on this earth on our watch? Do we want to see a long list of great cities like Cape Town struggling with the possibility of running out of water completely? Do we want more giant fires like the ones in California last month and across many parts of the world, Mongolia, I want above the, in Johan's home country, six big fires up north of the Arctic Circle in Sweden. The consequences should capture our attention. And we should conclude that we really have to change. And business has a role. Investors has a role. have a role. Governments have a role. Now, the good news is we have relief available to us, heaven sent, with solar energy and wind energy and batteries and electric vehicles and sustainable agriculture and sustainable forestry. For the 40 years I've worked on this, the essential problem has been and is now that the maximum which seems politically feasible still falls well short of the minimum necessary to satisfy the laws of physics. So what do we do in a situation like that? The answer is very simple. We expand the limits of what is politically feasible. And there too, businesses and investors and regional and local governments, along with nation states, can play a role. In conclusion, we can solve this, and the remaining question is, will we solve it? Last week, California, which if a nation would be the fifth largest national economy in the world, just passed and signed a new law. By 2045, 100% renewable energy will be required by law. 100% carbon neutral for the entire economy of the entire state of California. This is in the spirit of the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement is not yet producing the results we need, but we are approaching the five-year mark when, according to the treaty, every nation must take stock and increase ambition. So I hope that this uh, meeting, along with the others that have been organized here, will help to add to that momentum. And as I often say, I will close with a reminder that for anyone who thinks we do not, as human beings, have the political will to bring about the necessary changes, please remember that political will is itself a renewable resource. Thank you.